Hi guys! So over the next few days, I'm going to share with you a restoration I'm doing on a W.E. Hill violin at the moment. It's from 1890. The father of the owner personally travelled from Australia to London to commission the instrument and buy it for her. Now, the father was actually a prominent violinist in Queensland, Australia at the time, and was part in starting some of the orchestras and, uh, you know, was a really important musical figure in the area in the late 1800s. Now, as I'm working on it, I'll tell a little bit about the story, firstly, of the maker, but then also the story of the violinist, uh, because it's a really interesting story. The instrument hadn't been played for over 50 years, but had been looked after pretty well. So it's not a major restoration. It had like some open spots, it had a minor crack, and then the rest is basically just maintenance that hasn't been done for many years. So the violin is from W.E. Hill, but it was actually made by a French maker who worked with W.E. Hill. His name was Charles Francois Langanay. Uh, don't mind my pronunciation, I'm not French. But a super beautiful, like a really beautiful instrument with a really lovely varnish that they used at the time. Uh, also, I'm very keen to find out how the instrument sounds. Uh, like I said, it was played by a prominent player, like they played together in a quartet in the late 1800s. I've actually got a picture which I'm going to share of the family with instruments. Um, still working out if that is actually the instrument that I'm working on at the moment that's in the picture. But it's going to be a, yeah, it'll be an interesting few days. So keep an eye out for the videos. I'll try and post one every few days. And so the whole, there'll probably be about five different videos as I restore the instrument. And then when it's finished, I'm going to play it and look at it and see what it sounds like. Okay, how are you going guys? Uh, just thought you might want to... Uh, just watch in as I'm doing a bit of work on this uh, beautiful old William Hill and Sons violin um, from London 1890. Um, it's, it's really nice. It's one of their really nice varnishes. Um, it's got, um, as you can see, it's just had a lot of dirt build up. Everything's very dirty. The fingerboard needs planing, you can kind of see that, and uh, then it's got just a little bit of a crack here on the F hole. Um, this one I'm going to actually do from the outside, which is not my preferred method, but when it's something that small, I don't want to just open up a whole instrument and then, you know, with the chance of damaging things around the edges just for a tiny crack like that so I'll be able to do that one from the outside and um, then I can uh, I've actually got a little trick on how I can uh, put a reinforcement in from underneath um, yeah that that I use um, and then it'll be a bridge a sound post this instrument has basically not been played for quite a long time so it's going to be very exciting getting it back into a playable condition and hearing its sounds for the first time. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to plane the fingerboard. It's quite a dirty job um, because it, cre it generates a lot of dust um, from the... Um, d yeah, gen generates a lot of ebony dust and so it makes things really messy. Um, so I like to do it before I actually clean the instrument, it just makes sense. So one of the things I always do is I like to protect the instrument. Make sure it doesn't, uh, doesn't get any damage on the varnish while I'm working on it. My favourite pastime, looking for tools. I thought my workbench is pretty tidy, isn't it? So I've got my trusty knife, I'm just going to split off the, um, the nut at the top. It's glued on with uh, natural glue, so uh, you can split it off, which is really great. Using my favourite plane, my Lee Nielsen plane, super sharp, so it makes life really easy. 
one of the things I do is I make sure I use my template just to make sure the fingerboard shape is right. Uh, this one's a little bit too pointy, so it's like like pointy like this. Doop, doop. So I'm gonna make it, uh, and you can you should be able to see that too. Oh, well, I can see it. I don't know. Can you see this? Yeah, you can kind of see it, can't you? It's a bit too pointed, pointy. Yeah. So it should be the same shape. Um, otherwise, it's just not going to match up with the bridge curvature, and it means that the strings will be too close to the uh, fingerboard for the middle two strings, and they'll be too far apart for the G and the E. They'll probably be. I'll end up probably making. It, if if that was the case, they'd probably be exactly right for the E and the G. But then the middle two strings would be uh, too close to the fingerboard. And uh, that can just change the sound a little bit. I've already had my second coffee for, the, for today, so I'm full of energy. And you can actually talk to me too, which is always a good thing. Because you know what it's like. Don't talk to me before I've had my coffee. Do you agree, Coralie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coralie definitely agrees. Yeah. She knows. Number <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm pretty much finished planing this. I'm just doing the last little bit. I'm happy with the curvature, so I've checked through the curvature. I am happy with it. And uh, I'm just going to just round off. So, so when I plane it, there's like all these like little jagged edges. So I'm just going to take those off with a scraper. And I actually bend this scraper. And that way it gets the shape of the fingerboard. Okay, and just on the end of the fingerboard here, like these jagged edges just get a bit jagged. I actually just use a file. For some reason it's always a bit more jagged on the edge and um, the next step's gonna be sanding and usually when I sand, those edges wouldn't wear off if I didn't do that. The filing. I'm going to use different grades of sandpaper. I'm going to start off with the roughest grade, uh, either 120 grade or 80 grade if it's uh, if the fingerboard split a lot. So, so every fingerboard's different. So the timber quality on every ebony fingerboard is quite different. Uh, you can have some really high quality ebony with very straight growth or you can have some that's like quite not um, has lots of knots and things like that and it's grown like that and the timber that has a lot of knots um, would end up being very hard to plane because uh, it's easy to plane timber when the when the grain is straight but say, and even if the grain grows this way, it's easy to plane because you're cutting with the direction of the grain. But if the grain is this way and you're cutting, it actually really rips the, uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna hurt my fingers. Um, <laughs> it, it really rips the grain out and you can start getting these, uh, these really rough patches. This fingerboard only has one very tiny bit of a knot just up the top here but uh, that didn't really tear out too much. Now, if you do this often enough, you will probably ask, um, wouldn't the fingerboard be gone after a while? And that's exactly right. So fingerboard can last, depends how, how much a player plays and what kind of, so each player has different type of perspiration. Uh, so everyone sweats differently and, and, and the timbers are differently. So some fingerboards can look really bad when you start and others are, um, um, others only have very faint dents. And so different players have a different effect on fingerboards. So some players might need their fingerboard planed every six months, 
whereas other players might not need their fingerboard plane for two to three years. Uh, and that's even for professional players. But having a smooth fingerboard is really important for a clear sound. So if your fingerboard isn't smooth, it'll take away from the clarity of the sound. Uh, so it can make the sound, the instrument sound just a little bit fuzzy. Okay, 120 grade sandpaper. And I'm going to keep using finer grades until the, uh, the fingerboard is beautifully planed. Okay, I've done the second finest grade of sandpaper. And the last one's going to be with oil. Man, it's so dusty. Okay, so I need my fine sandpaper here. Get some oil. And it's going to make it look amazing. Take a look how beautiful that looks. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? Okay, the next step's gonna be actually cleaning the whole instrument. I've done all the dirty work. <laughs> I've done the dirty work. Um, now it's time to get onto the like cleaning the instrument part. This this has got an incredible like it's the the rosin here is literally baked into the instrument. It's going to be a bit of a tricky one. Just going to use warm water on this. Don't try this at home. It, like some of these instruments have really valuable varnish, and if you don't get this right, there are actually some varnishes that will literally dissolve in in water. But this one won't, but it's still, you, you know, you've got to get it just right to make sure that you don't do any damage. You don't ever want to get any water into the inside of the instrument. This is going to take a while, so I'm not probably not going to keep rolling through the whole process. Also, wash your hands when you're playing your instrument. It'll make sure that it gets less dirty. Like some of this. Isn't that bad? <laughs> dirt, especially just here. If they wash their hands, wouldn't have as much of a problem. Okay, uh, I've done quite a bit of cleaning on this, uh, but there needs to be more cleaning, especially. Just up around here, it's so badly built up, so I'm gonna, it's gonna be a bit of a process and uh, I'll, I'll need to use different, uh, I'll need to use different solvents to just very carefully just get rid of that top layer of rosin, so it's gonna be a bit of a tricky one. Um, but I'm just gonna be, uh, just about to head out to lunch, so I'm just gonna glue, uh, glue the saddle back on and uh, I also found that there was, oh, there's an open spot here. I'll, I'll probably deal with that at the same time as gluing this crack. Okay, so I'll glue this, uh, glue the saddle back on. Yeah, I'm doing this without my glasses. That's um, a little bit scary. Luckily, I can feel exactly where it should go. So I'll just hang this up here to dry. Look out for the next video in this series. So I'm, this is going to be a step-by-step -step process and you will see the instrument fully finished and restored and also I'll play the violin at the end. Now don't expect a solo, um, well it is a solo, but don't expect, you know, a soloist kind of a version, like uh, I'm an okay player, but I'm better at violin making than I am at playing violin. So this was day one, so press subscribe and press the little bell button down the bottom. That way you'll find out when the next video is up.